I'm Luis Scott, managing partner of Bader Scott Injury Lawyers, one of the fastest growing law firms in the country. And I'm also the co-founder of Eight Figure Firm Consulting. I've successfully built multiple companies by focusing on leadership, operations, and culture. Using these principles, my companies have generated close to $100 million in revenue. But before any of this success, I started my legal career as a receptionist, and I worked my way up to becoming managing partner. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with leaders and entrepreneurs who have had the guts to step out on their own and the courage to face adversity. They share with us their tips for achievement, the challenges they have faced, and the glory of success. I welcome you to the Guts and Glory Show. All right, Luis Scott here, host of the Guts and Glory Show. I feature top leaders who share the obstacles and challenges of leadership, the guts it takes to succeed, and the glory of success. Of success. Today, you will hear another inspiring interview from trial attorney John Gomez, who has built one of the most successful law firms in California, getting his clients almost half a billion dollars in verdicts and settlements. Before we get started, I want to tell you the sponsorship message. This episode has been brought to you by Eight Figure Firm Consulting. At Eight Figure Firm, we help businesses go from seven figures to eight figures by helping lawyers avoid doing the parts of the business they hate so that they can focus on making the impacts they love. For more information from Eight Figure Firm, go to www.eightfigurefirm.com. And before I introduce our guest, I want to give a special thanks and shout out to Michael Mogul of Chris Video Group. And you can find more information about Chris Video Group at chrisvideogroup.com. They specialize not only in videos, but in helping law firms create high quality impacts in their specific communities. So now I introduced our guest, trial attorney, John Gomez. And if you just look at his resume, you know he's a very achieved attorney. And I want to read some of the, the specifics about what he has earned. Lawyers USA has named him the National Lawyer of the Year in 2010. He was twice named San Diego's Trial Lawyer of the Year. The Consumer Attorneys of San Diego have awarded him an unprecedented 10 separate Outstanding Trial Lawyer Awards. He's been named a Top 100 California Attorney by the Los Angeles Daily Journal, a Top 10 San Diego Attorney overall by San Diego Metropolitan Magazine, and has been voted by his peers as a Top 10 San Diego Super Lawyer every year since 2012. But that's not it. He also has some incredible achievements inside the courtroom, winning a $106 million wrongful uh, death jury verdict arising out of San Diego's infamous American Beauty murder, a 16.5 jury verdict against Pollo Loco, and a $10.8 million jury verdict against Pizza Hut. John, welcome to the Guts and Glory Show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm fired up. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I want to get started and just talk to you about San Diego. Uh, it's one of my most favorite cities, and uh, I've had an opportunity to go there uh, two times on business, but haven't really been able to enjoy it. Uh, tell me about what it's like living in San Diego. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to grow up here. My dad was in the Navy, and so uh, we would kind of bounce between the East Coast and San Diego, and he ended up stationed out here. So I grew up here. It's my town. Um, it's, um, it's, it's got great climate. You know, first of all, we're renowned for our consistent good weather. Uh, we have Mexico, uh, you know, 20 minutes away from downtown. We have the mountains, you know, so you can go snowboarding or, you know, mountain biking or skiing, whatever you like. And we can surf, you know, we have, um, I think the best Mexican food in the world. And so it's an oh, awesome place Hands down. <laughs> yeah, hands down. That's for sure. I know when I went to uh, San Diego the first time, the first thing that I did was I, I researched best places to eat. And, and I found out that the Food Network apparently lives in your city when it comes to Mexican food. So that was, that was an incredible experience to be able to do that. Um, I, I also saw that you played uh, football in college. Um, what was that experience like? I mean, I'm a huge football fan. Yeah, it was fun. You know, I ended up um, at a one two a school you know, which means for those that don't know, like we wouldn't get that many people to our games. You know, uh, <laughs> the most I ever played in front of was like, you know, 15,000 or so. But, you know, being on a college team uh, is a special experience no matter where it is. And, you know, I had great teammates and it was a great experience. And I think really it, it was the reason I went to college. I wouldn't have gone to college otherwise. So I'm appreciative of that. 
Absolutely. You know, the thing is that, that I played sports in college too. I played a, a baseball uh, at a division two school. So it's even one lower ring under, you know, division one, two a, but I believe baseball really shaped my life in a big way. And so I'm curious to hear how has football really uh, shaped your business and the way you operate kind of as a professional? It taught me, I, I was never the most athletic guy. Um, you know, I had enough to get by, but I wasn't, you know, blessed genetically, let's say. Um, and so it taught me the value of hard work, you know, first of all. And I think that that is, if you want to start a business or run a business successfully or be successful in virtually anything you knew, I, I think hard work is always going to be the most important thing. And of course, you know, on a, a college sports team, you spend a lot of time with these guys that come from all over the world and country and whatever, different, different cultures, different colors, different backgrounds. You know, you get to learn to get along with all kinds of different people. And I think that's always a helpful skill as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I think without organized sports, I don't think I would have developed the discipline that I have, you know, as a, as a professional, because when, when I was playing baseball, we were getting up every morning to run. We were doing two a day camps, not as aggressively as, you know, being in football pads, but two a day camps and discipline in, in, in the gym and things like that. All of that really plays a huge impact in having a consistent routine. Um, you, you know, I want to dive into the, the real question for today and probably what a lot of listeners are going to be uh, asking. And that's how did you start your business? How did you start your law practice? Uh, how did you decide to go on your own? And, and I want to ask it with this context. I went out on my own after being at a law firm for about 14 and a half years. And I can just tell you, it's an incredibly scary decision to take that leap of faith, to go out on your own. And I, and I remember reading your story online where you only had two cases when you went out on your own. Um, like, what made you do it? How did you make that decision? Um, and, and what is it that got you to start your own business? Well, I mean, to be honest, um, I was assisted in that decision because I was at another law firm, uh, with a very well-known and uh, respected trial lawyer. And, you know, I got, mm -hmm. maybe there were, there were two sort of alpha dogs emerging at the same law firm and it was his law firm. And so he right. assisted me in making that decision by asking me to leave. <laughs> Uh, but I've been thinking about it for a while. Um, and so, um, you know, I just remember, you know, walking down the street, you know, the day, the morning that he fired me and just looking up at the buildings and saying, I wonder where I'm going to put my office. I wonder, you know, what I'm going to do. Wow. But I had already thought of it in advance. I had already thought of uh, having a place that could reflect my culture and values and my brand and my way of doing things. And so he was just, I think, a blessing in disguise of getting me there. It, I mean, that's a great way to look at that and, you know, the per perspective, because I think a lot of us in the legal field, you know, I talk about leaving my firm after 14 and a half years. I had the assistance as well uh, <laughs> in that situation, so I can definitely relate in that. But I think a lot of us need that push. And um, uh, some of us ha have not needed the push and have gone out on our own. But for me, I needed that push because I, I felt that I, I couldn't leave for a long time. and uh, alignment is huge. You know, that's what you mentioned, that there was not really a, a good alignment. Now, you know, fast forward 15 years, 20 years later, you have this very successful business. Hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue have been generated through your business. 20 plus lawyers, dozens and dozens of employees. You know, people see that and they don't really understand what it took to get to that point, the trials that you went through. So I'm curious to hear from, from day one, starting the firm to today, where you now have this huge business, super successful, you know, and completely recognized throughout the state and the country. Like, what are some trials that you've gone through and what are some things that you've done to overcome those trials? Yeah, so certainly um, it hasn't all been smooth sailing. There have definitely been some ups and downs. I'll say, you know, financially, you know, we are a trial firm, a pure contingency fee firm. Um, mm. and so we only get paid if we win and, you know, our revenue can, can vary somewhat dramatically. And so I've definitely had probably at least two that jump out of my mind periods where, you know, we almost hit the ground, you know, yeah. literally almost, 
you know, went under. Um, one very early in my firm um, before I, I got a big verdict. Um, and then one where I really think I grew a little too aggressively without the capital mm -hmm. uh, to justify that and maybe made some hires of people that weren't well advised, mm -hmm. got a little ahead of myself, wasn't keeping an eye on things the way I should have. And that was another period where I had to make some really drastic decisions just to save the company. I had to lay off like mm. 15 people. Oh um, my gosh. Yeah. And it was literally, am I going to make payroll? And that was only, yeah. you know, like three, four years ago that that happened. And, wow. you know, ever since then I've, and to that, to that point, I will say, you know, for your listeners, you know, I was pretty much exclusively focused on being a trial lawyer to the detriment of running the business. Mm. Mm. And that experience caused me to wake up a little bit and say, look, you know, I have to be a good steward of this place and these employees and focus on the yep. business. I mean, you bring up an interesting point. A lot of lawyers, they start off and they don't see themselves as business owners. And so they never treat the business like a business. They treat it like a law practice. You know, I always talk about turning law practices into law businesses. There's a business aspect to this professional service. And if you don't, watch the business part, you won't have anything to try. You won't have any cases to try. Um, so that is, that is a huge point uh, when it comes to that. And, you know, you mentioned something else about growing too fast. I think a lot of uh, lawyers don't realize that there's the, the, the no faster than, right? You have to figure out how fast can you actually grow with the cash flow that you have, with the money, with the resources, because in a contingency practice, like what we do, if you don't have the cash, it's really hard to grow. And we don't, we don't have access to angel uh, investors. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. So um, it's a very interesting point. You know, I was looking at one of your videos online and I saw a quote uh, where it talks about the first commandment of jujitsu. You probably know what, what it is. And it said to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. You know, tell me about how that first commandment of jujitsu has really helped define your law firm and building it into the success that you know that you have today. Yeah, I thank you for that. I I, um, I really like jujitsu and and um, practice it and train in it. So thanks for that. I think um, you know in a couple ways. One, um, you know personally, you know I think that um, you have to have uh, something you know, more important or grounding or, you know, superior to you that keeps you kind of focused on your core principles. Um, you know, for me, um, that's a relationship uh, with uh, Jesus Christ. Um, and so for me, you know, that keeps me strong enough that, that I don't believe that sort of daily struggles can throw me off my game. You know, within the practice of law, I feel like you know, just like we talked about before, hard work and solid preparation, you know, is going to allow you to be ready to meet the moment, you know, whatever comes your way, you know, so nothing, none of that can disturb my peace of mind. And then with right. a firm, you know, um, what I'm learning is having data and processes and systems and um, so that we have repeatable and predictable outcomes and performance really helps keep my peace of mind. In, in the place it should be. So, you know, I would say a combination of those three things. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so so crucial what you're talking about, keeping the data and keeping the the numbers, knowing your numbers and running it like a business. I mean, I, I don't know how many times I talk to lawyers and they don't run their law firm like a business. They just, they think that the cases are gonna come in. It reminds me of the, uh, of the movie, if you build it, they will come, you know? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that in the legal field. You have to actually manage your, your numbers. You know, you, you brought up uh, your relationship with Christ and it's something that's really personal to me. I'm a pastor's kid, so I grew up in, in the church and you don't find a lot of people uh, that are in that space, in the legal space that have a relationship with Christ, at least not, not where I'm from. Uh, it doesn't tend to be like that. And I read one of your blogs on your website. It was called My Last Trial, A Question of Faith, yeah, where you wrote it from Costa Rica. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you <laughs> talked about losing three consecutive trials and then winning this $16 million verdict. And I'm, I'm curious, how has faith really guided you in building your business and being a lawyer and just being the success that you are today, personally and professionally? Like, How has faith played a part in that? Well, 
you know, I, I'm sure you would say the same thing, but for me, it directs everything that I do. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, there's that constant relationship and that constant, you know, prayer. And, you know, you just feel that presence and it gives you strength and direction, you know, and, and mm -hmm. if I'm struggling with something, you know, I'll give it up to prayer and, and suddenly, you know, I'll have an answer that seems to make sense and work. You know, otherwise I would say that, you know, running an organization, you know, requires the respect of your team members, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're out carousing and, and, you know, not doing the right thing and behaving in a way that's, you know, maybe not something that your team members respect, then I don't think they're going to follow you the way that you need them to. And, right. you know, not everyone's Christian or, or a person of faith, but I think I would, I would say pretty much everyone respects the lifestyle that we live, you mm -hmm. know, and the choices we make and how we treat people. And so if we're able to live our lives and treat people the way that, you know, uh, Christ teaches us, you know, that's mm -hmm. going to engender respect and, and admiration and eventually following you know not only from your team but from you know others in the community i've never lost a case because they find out i'm christian i get a lot oh, yeah. of cases because they find out i'm christian <laughs> I, I i would agree with that it's it's one of the biggest cases that i ever worked on was a, a, a lady from a church who it was very important to her that she had a christian lawyer so i, I would agree with that uh, wholeheartedly you know for me my faith what it does is that it gives me hope um, you know, we, we talk about eternal hope and so forth, but it gives me hope even here for my life. You, you know, a lot of people, especially during uh, coronavirus, this is so relevant. A lot of people have lost hope. They've lost hope in their future. They've lost hope in their, their financial future, their personal future, their relationship future. You know, divorce is, an, is, is at an all time high right now, especially with people living in close confines and not being able to go out. And I think a lot of people lose hope for their business. You know, they ask themselves the question, when is it going to happen for me? And maybe in the past, you've asked yourself that question. When is this going to happen for me? When is it going to be a turning point in my business? When am I going to be able to achieve what I want? When, is it, when am I going to have the car that I want, the house that I want, the family that I want, the things that I want? And uh, I'd love to hear your insight as to when was the turning point for you when you knew like this was going to happen for you and it was going to be a success. Um, and, and I ask that question because I always hear it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. So like, when was your overnight success moment? You know, frankly, I, um, I'm still working on it. You know, I feel like, yeah. I feel like I've had abundant success, you know, but I feel like I'm just getting started. And, um, you know, I have a lot of big plans that all involve sort of, you know, looking forward and, and forward thinking. And I think, you know, what you talk about really is a mindset, you know, you can't just sit back and wait for success to come. You have to be proactively, you know, doing mm -hmm. things that will uh, radically increase the, the chance of success. And I think, um, and I think you're right. I think just faith um, in, in, you know, something greater than yourself or even faith in yourself and, and your mm -hmm. vision and, and, and work ethic is something that, you know, can get through, get us through times like this. I'm sure like you, like me, look at this time of COVID as really a time of opportunity. Sure, there's going to be yes. some, maybe some uh, short-term setbacks, but coming out on the other side, I think, you know, I'm very, very optimistic about what things are going to look like for us. Yeah, I mean, mindset is huge. It's, it's absolutely important and crucial to, to getting to that next level. I, I really believe that. And you mentioned that, that sometimes you have to have courage to do things. And, I, and I'm curious, like, what's the gutsiest decision you've ever had to make in your life? And where do you credit it taking you? Uh, you know, what, what can you think of? <laughs> the gutsiest decision I've made in my life. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, wow, the gutsiest decision. Well, you know, the gutsiest uh, business. Well, let me see. The gutsiest decision I've ever made in my life. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll go way back and just say, you know, um, my parents really weren't, I would say super involved in my life, you know, at the time I went to college, um, mm -hmm. and you know, weren't 
um, sources of, you know, they didn't, they weren't the ones that told me to go to college or helped me to go to college or helped me with the applications or, you know, provided money at that time, really. Um, and so I guess I would just say at that time, you know, I just had visions of becoming a successful um, collegiate student athlete. And I did it all yeah. by myself you know, from nowhere and filled out all the financial aid or whatever it was and, and somehow found my way, you know, eventually at a great Catholic um, college, you know, University of San Diego, and then eventually somehow got into Yale Law School. And that was all just me. And so I think the gutsiest decision was really um, believing in myself even back then, I would say. I, I mean, that's huge. I, I, you know, it's funny because when you become successful, you always downplay your success. You never see yourself like other people see you. You know, I, I, I walk around the office and, and people say that, that uh, employees are scared of, of me walking around the office. I'm like, why? I'm like the most fun loving guy on the world, you know, and they don't see you that way. And it's funny how we, we see ourselves. And I, I love that because uh, at the moment that you stop losing that humility, really, you've lost everything. I mean, humility is everything as it relates to to your life, what, what would you tell someone who's living in fear of making the decision that you made, you know, making that decision of believing in yourself, going out on your own, going to school, going to Yale, like what would you tell that person who's living in fear and, and is not living what their life should be? Like, what would you say to them? I think the best advice, you know, that I would give for them is, to talk to people who have taken that jump before or taken mm -hmm. that leap before, whether it's, you know, there's a lot of kids that grow up in places and they're kind of taught, you know, okay, you're not college material or kids from here don't go to college or you shouldn't go to college. You know, that kid, I would encourage them to talk to people that have gone to college and, you know, that can provide, you know, stories or examples of inspiration. And I would say the same thing with lawyers, you know, that are unhappy doing what they're doing or are contemplating, you know, starting a firm, you know, talk to people who have done it, mm -hmm. you know, and you'll find out, I think oftentimes that it's not as overwhelming, you know, as you think, or as scary as you think, you know, because yeah. lots of ordinary people like you and I have done all of those things and come out the better for it. Yeah. You know, I wonder uh, how much negativity in the legal profession plays into the way people respond. When I was going to law school, if I told someone that I was going to law school, you had many people, and you've probably heard this, don't go to law school. You're going to waste your time. You're going to waste your money. You're going to end up becoming you know, a, a slave to a firm. Uh, don't, don't start your own place. It's not going to be successful. There's too many lawyers. I hear this all the time. There's too many lawyers. There's not enough cases, this, that, and the other. And I, I think that, that it's, it's one of the reasons that people don't make that decision. Um, and there's the negativity, but then there's the belief. Um, when you start something new, even when I started the podcast, uh, one of the things here, I am a successful business owner. And yet I was kind of nervous about starting the podcast. Cause like, I wasn't sure if it was going to be successful. Are people going to listen? Is it going to do anything? So I, I, I do think that knowing who you are developing yourself and trusting that you're going to, you're going to have a good outcome. And like you said, that ordin if ordinary guys like us can do it and talking to those guys, uh, I think it's going to help in a, in a big way. Now, your firm has now grown to a, to a significant size, and I'm very um, pro-leadership. I believe leadership runs a business. Like, if you don't have leaders, your business is not going to ultimately succeed. What, what role has leadership played in your business, and what advice would you give to people who are trying to be the jack of all trades, run their business, be the only leader, do everything themselves? Like, what, what would you tell them? Yeah, so... Um I think leadership, um, I agree with you, is, is the single most important uh, factor in defining the success of an organization. And I will say um, the, the, what I would tell you know, people um, listening to this is you know, surround yourself, if you are sort of the visionary, the firm owner, you know, surround yourself with people that can you know, uh, help you lead so that you can mm. just operate at your highest and best use. You know, I have, for me, for example, you know, I am kind of a visionary, a trial lawyer, you know, a rah-rah culture guy, but not great with details and processes. And, you know, I don't want to deal with all that stuff. And so, you know, I have 
you know, a person who's a great, smart guy who loves that stuff, you know, so right. I put him into that role, you know, according to, um, you know, some systems of management, I'm the visionary and he's the integrator, right? Yeah. And then we have, you know, other people that lead as well. So I think you need to, I think always lead from the top with, um, you know, uh, inspiration and, um, like I said, doing the right thing all the time, but you need to let go of some things really, if you want to be successful and if you have an organization of any size. Did you find that letting go of some things as you were growing your business, did you find that to be difficult or was that not that difficult for you? Like what, what made you make that transition? Cause it's hard for a lot of people. Yeah, I think um, initially I had some trouble letting go of some things, you know, but then I just realized I wasn't very good at them and or, mm. you know, the things wouldn't get done if I didn't delegate them or have someone else do them because I would get stuck in a three week trial or whatever, you know, and come back and nothing's happened. I mean, that's not a good thing. Um, yeah. So over time, I've become better at it as I as mm. I talk to more people that know more than I do about running businesses. Yeah, that's crucial. One of the things that I've done is I've gone outside of the industry and asked questions to people in other industries. And, you know, what are, what are business leaders doing in other industries that are not like ours uh, so that we could set it up more like a, you know, traditional business. And I think that's been a huge thing is just getting that, that advice from, from other industries and so forth. Now, uh, what, what would you say is the, uh, the pinnacle of success that you've had so far. I know we're, we're both still growing. We, we want to continue thriving, you know, uh, striving for more, but what was, what's one of like your best glory stories uh, that you have in your career so far? Huh? Um, you know, I think that the, the glory stories take place on um, a daily basis or a, a, no, mm. a regular basis. And they're really just, um, I think testimonies by either, you know, clients or team members about the values of our organization and um, the benefit they have by virtue of being part of it, either as a team member or as a customer. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, just, I think our ability to interact with and affect the lives of a lot of people in a very positive way to me on sort of a recurring basis um, to me defines the pinnacle of success. You know, I could, I could say, Oh, you know, this trial or this trial or this trial, but to me, it's really um, like really building a place that really enriches people's lives. Mm. And so, you know, whenever I hear about that or a little story about that or how mm. much, you know, like someone will put a review on, you know, Google and they'll say, oh, my sister works there and she loves it, you know, and, yeah. and they're so, they treat her so well. And that kind of thing to me is what, yeah. you know, gets me going. You know, it's a great place to be when you get there, when, when you're not really worried about the big cases, you're really worried about impacting other people's lives. I just... Uh, I don't know if you've ever done this exercise, but I went through a personal vision exercise, you know, kind of defining my own vision. And I, and I wrote the words, you know, living a life of significance, like just meaning something to someone. And I think it's a special place to, to finally get somewhere like that. What, what role does social media play in, in your business or in the way people perceive uh, our, our industry? And what are some things that you would say to someone who is, you know, concerned about that, that perception, uh, because right now in social media, uh, you see a lot of lawyers advertising, everybody's advertising. It's all about money, 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 money. But here we have, you know, we're, 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 we're talking together and we both want to lead a life of significance. We both want to make an impact in our employees and lives. And we know it's not always all about the money. How do we change that perception and, and get people to really trust in, in the legal profession? Um, it's really a beautiful profession that helps so many people. Yeah, I think that can be hard. Um, I think, you know, um, even beyond just social media, it's really establishing a brand and identity. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we need to be really proactive in terms of how we define that brand or identity. And so you bring up social media, obviously that has, you know, wide reach. So a lot of people see us, 
you know, mm-hmm. so I think, you know, we proactively try to, you know, put content on there or have our content reflect um, the values that, that, that define us as a firm, you know, so mm-hmm. we'll put on stuff on there about helping out or, you know, if, if, you know, our client, you know, does well and is appreciative, you know, we'll put that on there. You know, we'll humanize, you know, where we work. Today's National Dog Day. I happen to know that. Yeah. So a lot of pictures of, yeah, a lot of pictures of employee dogs are going up today, you know, because everyone likes dogs. You know, right. I, and, and I, I will say, like, we've done some um, paid social media campaigns targeting particular kinds of cases. And so one example um, is, you know, post-COVID, you know, we were trying to um, reach out on some cruise ship cases, mm. nursing home cases, and really got some very um, aggressive feed or blowback, I will say. Mm. Um, you know, um, sometimes we'll put up ads and, you know, everybody goes crazy and calls us ambulance chasers and this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and I think, you know, you have to be careful of that, you know, but ultimately... I don't know that you're going to change those people's minds. You know, I think what we need to do is, you know, walk the walk, you know, truly walk the walk as leaders Mm -hmm. and as organizations. And I think that will be reflected in our community and social presence. Yeah. You said something really interesting about blowback. And I, and I always think about the word criticism. There are people out there who won't start a business, won't do anything of significance because they're afraid of that criticism and that blowback you know, what would you say to them? Like, how do you overcome that? Because that's, that's something that was even hard for me, especially as a a young lawyer is overcoming that rejection. Like, what would you say to that person who has that fear? Like, how do you, how do you overcome that? Yeah, I I would say, you know, um, I think you have to define your values Mm. in terms of your own values. And so I believe that you're always going to have people that criticize you, um, people, you know, I'll call them haters. You know, <laughs> I, I have tons of haters, you know, because I've been successful in my business and I'm a trial lawyer, you know, and so how do I answer that? You know, I try to live a, a life, you know, that people can admire and respect. I try to help people. Mm-hmm. I try to do the right thing. You know, uh, once in a while, you know, it's, it, when I was getting a lot of blowback, you know, on social about COVID uh, media ads, or I'm sorry, social media ads, I actually did a little video for the haters, you know, and, and <laughs> told them like, look, we're really trying to just help people. You know, these are hard times for some people, you know, and, and some people would put, oh, you, you know, you should do this instead. And so I just said, you know, here's what we're doing for the community and healthcare providers and my church and this, that, and the other, you know, and who knows if they ever lie you know, watched or listened. But the main thing is, you know, you can't allow the naysayers to define, you know, who you are. I mean, your values are your, your values. If you're embarrassed mm. and believe that somehow you're not, you know, um, acting in a way that's consistent with your values, then don't do it. But if you do yeah. believe it, and there's plenty of, you know, support in scripture for what we do, then, then I walk the walk very proudly it's so true. If you believe in what you're doing, there's nothing that's going to detract you from doing it. Like I, I, even when I was in law school and I was hearing about the ambulance chasing and all that stuff, like that never stopped me because I just believe that what we were going to do as lawyers was going to be beneficial to people. And I always say the person who talks about ambulance chasers has never had a significant injury or a loved one in a significant injury because their mindset changes completely when that happens. Then they want the full extent of the law, you know, put on the other person. So uh, it's very, yeah, very that's interesting. That's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for like someone to call us up and I, and I was like, hmm, that name sounds a little familiar. And then go back <laughs> and they're called as ambulance stations. But I totally agree. Now, when, you know, one of the things about being an entrepreneur and being a business owner and running a successful business, whether it's a product business or a professional service business is balance. You know, many of my entrepreneur friends, they are addicted to the business. They, they, all they do is work, right? And you could probably, you could probably identify with that maybe even early on in your career, maybe to some extent now, what, what are some of the things that you do, like the rituals that you have? 
to keep you balanced and consistent because the, the reality of, of business is that it's all about longevity. You know, it's not about the short period. It's like, how do you stay consistent over a long period of time? What are some things that you do on a daily basis to do that? You know, I would say um, in terms of my health and happiness, I make sure um, I get plenty of sleep. Uh, I stay very physically active. You know, I do um, judo and jujitsu. Mm -hmm. I do hot yoga um, and um, in the mornings. So I go to bed early. I go to bed like 8.39, something like that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. I just, <laughs> but I get up early. I get up like, you know, 4. I got you. And so I get up at 4, and the first thing I'll do is meditate, and then I pray, and then I um, read some scripture, and then I do some exercise. And so by like 7.30, you know, I feel like I've gotten a lot of me time in, you know, and yeah. I'm still saving some me time later in the day. I make sure that, um, you know, I go to all my kids, you know, athletic events, I coach them all. Mm. And, and I think that um, the, the way people become sort of imprisoned by work is by not, um, by not delegating to some degree mm. or, because I know, like, I don't, I'll look at my emails um, sort of at the end of the day before I end my day, like, you know, five or maybe six if it's a late day. And I'm not really looking at them again until four in the morning. And I, and I pretty much, that's, and then I just devote time. Um, I devote blocks of times to dealing with emails. Mm. I think it's been very helpful to me. You know, I don't think it does anyone any good to be always just, back and yeah. forth back and forth back and forth yeah you know um so i i set off times to do that so i'm very um deliberate about my time blocks and allocations and then i know that if anything huge is going on in the business then you know one of my um one of my uh core leaders will text me and you can always find me on a text yeah i don't know i don't know if that's at all helpful but i believe I believe taking care of you is super important, you know, and, and taking care of your family and your health. Yeah. I mean, what, what you're really saying is boundaries, creating boundaries in your life where, where you have boundaries for family and for yourself and for others, because if not, people will consume every single minute of your day. And if you're not healthy, you can't really do good things for other people. So that's, that's, that's a great point. Now, what would you recommend to a person who wants to start their own law firm or maybe has a law firm and, and hasn't been able to achieve the level of success that they want? You know, everybody has a different like uh, bar or, or, or what they consider to be success. And what would you tell them if they haven't reached what they want or if they're starting their own firm? Like what advice would you give them? I would say, you know, first of all, they have to clearly define success in their minds. Mm, you know, before yep. they can figure out, you know, how am I going to be successful or how do I get to be successful? You know, what I find is too often uh, lawyers spend too much time trying to be better lawyers mm. and, you know, just completely neglecting the business. And yep. so, um, you know, the, the great thing about COVID is that I can't try cases <laughs> And I can't really travel, <laughs> the two things that I pretty much love to do. Um, yeah. And so it's forced me to really look hard at the business. And um, what I've noticed, and so I've spent, you know, a, a huge percentage of my time right now, you know, working on the business and learning from other successful law firm owners. And so um, what I would say, I see all these lawyers and they're watching all these webinars every day about how to try yes. this case and how to cross-examine this witness, you know, I would encourage them all maybe to just, you know, maybe cut down on that a little bit and maybe yeah. watch some content about how to have a successful law practice. And, mm. and then, you know, talk to successful law firm owners, you know, who in my experience, like to me, business leaders are way more giving of their time and secrets than trial lawyers trial yep. lawyers like trial lawyers will give you some but you know <laughs> not, not as openly as the, 
as business because business leaders are a special group. You know, if you yeah. know of successful law firm or other business owners, and you say, "Well, how, what? Take them to lunch or whatever. Zoom if you can't do that." You know, what was the key to your success? What advice would you give me? You know, I'm thinking about this. This is what I want to do. How would you get there? Then you'll you'll save yourself so much time, so much money, so much heartache. Um, and I've only recently started doing that, and I've been amazed at how giving you know people are. And I would also encourage you know those people to join organizations like Crisp, which you mm -hmm. announced at the beginning of your show. You know, which bring together you know business leaders you know to talk about how they run their firms. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. And, you know, it's funny, we got we came full circle, you started your practice out of necessity. And now you are going to business leaders out of necessity, uh, because of COVID. So that's awesome. Um, I just want to thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a treat having you. And uh, we've been talking with John Gomez, the owner of Gomez trial attorneys from San Diego, California. John, where can people find you if they have a case or need information about legal services in California? Uh, they can always just go to our website, thegomezfirm.com. Uh, they can call the firm, 866-TRAW-LAW, or they can call my uh, cell phone, 619-850-2813. Maybe text me first so I know, you know <laughs> that I know, I know to pick up, but 619-850-2813. Uh, you heard it here first. John Gomez gave his cell phone number. If you have a case in California, be sure to call him. And uh, don't forget, his shirt says it, the future is greater than the past. Thanks, John, for, for being on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to the Guts and Glory Show with Louise Scott. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to share. For more information on this episode, please see the show notes at www.gutsandgloryshow.com. And join us next time as we talk to another leader in business that had the guts to overcome all odds for the glory of success.